Good evening, folks. I think we'll make a start. You will have noticed that by the time the lecturer gets to his table, he becomes very dry. So for the first time, somebody to provide you with a glass of water. Thank you very much. I'll try to still be interesting if I can. Thank you for coming again. And if any of you are here for the first time, a special welcome to this series of public lectures on the big topic of creation. We see it every day. We tend to become blasé about it and take it for granted. But if you stop for a minute, it's the most amazing, wonderful thing that could be. Some people say it wasn't creation, it was evolution. And these lectures are really designed to help you to make up your mind whether you think the best explanation for everything you see around you is God's creation or is just a process of mindless, purposeless, random evolution over millions and billions of years. I can't make up your mind for you, but I'll try my best to give you the best evidence I have for what I believe to be the case. So Monday evening, we asked the big question about creation or evolution. What does science say about it? I tried to tell you that science really points to creation, and science really has a lot to say that negatives evolution. Last evening, we asked the question, what do the fossils show? Because the popular opinion and the popular presentation you get is that the fossils and the rocks tell you evolution has taken place. They do no such thing. Tonight, a very interesting one, I hope, how did life begin? So let's get going and please join me to look at this presentation on how life began. We know how our lives began. We all had parents and they had parents. But if you go far enough back, You've got to think about how life on earth actually began for the first time. So, how did life begin? You see it all around you. We drove 30 feet ahead and back this afternoon, and all around us was evidence of life. There were lambs in the field, there were cows with their calves, there were geese. Indeed, it was green fields. We often think that life belongs only to the animal kingdom, but the vegetable kingdom is really bursting with life. And especially at this time of year, it's not difficult to see it. Now, if I was to ask you to define what life is, would you run it? We think we know what life is, but to put that into words is not easy. So, how would you answer this question? What is life? Well, most folk of a younger generation than mine would Google it and see what Google says. I usually look it up in a book, because Google has just taken things from the book, books anyway to make me more easily accessible. So let's see the kind of things that Google and indeed the books tell us. They say that life is a property which distinguishes a living thing from a dead one. Or life is animate existence. Life is that period between birth and death. And does that help any? It's not merely describing life, it's not really telling you what life is. And it's easier to describe life and living things than actually to define this quality, this particular thing that we're so accustomed to, we call it life. It is something extra, something extra added to physical matter. We all know the difference between a living thing and a non-living thing. And living things have something extra. But to define exactly what that something is, is not easy. Not only though, we can proceed without an adequate definition. It is, I think you agree, a spiritual quality. It's not a material one, it's a spiritual quality. And it is recognisable. It's recognisable especially in the likes of us here tonight. But not confined to that. I don't know what your favourite pet is, but you know that there's something about that. And we often forget that even in the vegetable kingdom, which is alive, very much alive, there is that extra quality. Although it might be stretching a point to say it's spiritual, it's there. What is easier, however, is to list the biological characteristics that belong to all living things. Those of you who frequently or not recently done biology at school will know this, so let me run through it quickly. There are seven specific characteristics belonging to all living things. They are, they are able to move. 
some source that normally we call excrete. They excrete waste material once they drop what they need out of it, they get rid of the rest. They grow and develop. They respond or indeed they adapt to their environment. People call that their sensitivity. And of course they reproduce. And that last one is perhaps the most important for us to focus on tonight that living things do reproduce other living things. And if we're asking the question tonight, where did life come from? Then this key characteristic of being able to reproduce is the one we need to focus on. Because it's easy for us to see where we came from in terms of our immediate ancestors. And you may be involved somewhere in trying to trace your family tree. But as far back as you can go, it's a big question, how did it all begin? That's our topic for tonight. Oh, and there's one more thing. All living things, whether they be grass in the field or each one of us sitting here, every living thing is made up of tiny cells. And these cells reproduce themselves. These cells replicate, they duplicate to make the organism viable. So these are the seven living things, seven characteristics of it that belong to all living things. Let's look at the difference between living things and non-living things. One thing you'll need to agree with me on at least is this. All life is fragile. That chunk of rock in the middle of the picture is not fragile. You can smash it with a hammer, at least you can try to. But these tiny flowers growing beside it, and the grass, and the leaves all around it, are very fragile. If you pluck them and crush them in your hand, they die. They are fragile. Another thing that we know about life is that it is an organic process which proceeds in liquid water. All life on earth lives in an aqueous environment. Furthermore, life requires a specific temperature range which is normally quoted as between 0 and 40 degrees C. Life also requires some protection because it is fragile. It needs protected. And we're in here tonight and we are being protected by a whole lot of things that we don't even think about. Well, the obvious ones like the clothes we wear and the heating that it hits on and the roof above our heads right into the environment of the planet Earth that we live on. All Earth, all the life on Earth, needs protection. And the other thing, of course, is that life on Earth needs an energy source, needs food. And ultimately, if you trace it back far enough, all that energy comes from the sun. But, while life ends easily, and easily be sucked out, it needs a start. So it's easy to kill things. You can put your foot on a dollar. Is that what I'm going to do? I don't know what An insect, shall we call it. You can put your foot on an insect and that's it no more. But you cannot make an insect live. Life is fragile. Life needs a start. And then we should say to ourselves, well, what happens at death? It's easy to go from life to death. What happens when some living thing dies? Whether it be a blade of grass, or an insect, or a fish that you catch, or whatever dies, what happens actually? Well, the physical components remain the same at death, but they very quickly decompose and change. But at the moment of death, the physical components are identical to what they were the second before death happened. But the seven characteristics that I listed are no longer seen. They disappeared. The change is a dramatic one. There is no response to any stimulus to something in something that has died. The spiritual component, as I've called it, vanishes. 
And the next question is, well, where does it go? And does it matter where it goes? And actually, science can't tell us. Science can tell you about the physical thing, about the cells, about why things grow and develop and reproduce. Science can explain that. But science cannot tell you a thing about where life goes once death has taken place. We'll maybe return to that point later. Tonight is really about not so much where life goes when it's finished, but how it originated. Where did it originate? How did it originate? Those of you who were here on Monday night, I think it was, would remember when I put up a slide which had the big word biogenesis in it. And the law of biogenesis is a very simple one, and a very obvious one. It says this, that life cannot come from dead matter. And this, by the way, people who are wedded to the theory of evolution and want to believe in the Big Bang cannot possibly say that somewhere after the Big Bang there was a germ of life left surviving. Because if anything happened at the Big Bang, given the temperatures and conditions that they demand for it, you would get total sterility. No chance of any living thing surviving the Big Bang. I'm not saying I believe in the Big Bang. I'm saying that people who do believe in the Big Bang cannot get around the fact that everything is totally sterile to begin with. And life cannot come from dead matter, so science says. So what does science say? Science has nothing else to say. There's no other clear answer about where life began or how life began. They just say in their proposal, in their proposal for the theory of evolution, we assume that life started there. Simple guesses are made, but no clear answer at all. So if science can't tell us, somebody else might be able to tell us where and how life began. I wonder what the answer will be if we ask clearly where and how life began. Here's this slide about biogenesis again. Let me just remind you about it. It's a very important one. That dead matter does not, cannot produce life that living things can be derived only from other living things. We depend on that, you know, a lot of the time. The science of antiseptics, if you have to undergo a surgical operation, you're probably glad that the law of biogenesis applies because sterile conditions are there to inhibit infection. And we benefit from it. But the point I'm making now is that all life must have come from a non-natural source. If natural dead things can't and don't begin life, it must be a non-natural source to be alive. What's the choice? What non-natural sources do we know about? I only know about one that's effective, and the name is the Almighty God. He is the author of life, and I firmly believe, because the Bible tells me so, that God is the beginning <coughs> of all life on earth and everywhere else. We'll return to that later as well. So let's digress slightly to the right hand side now and say yes, life does begin, but life forms change. And in evolution theory, a lot is made about the changes in life forms. So let's have a look at the changes that can take place in different life forms. We've asked already, do they evolve? We ask already, do they adapt? What is natural selection and how does it happen? I think I said on Monday night I'd revisit this, so now's the time that we are revisiting it. To look at the question of evolution, adaptation, natural selection, and how each of these takes place. Here's a fairly common picture of various types of dogs. There are, of course, hundreds of different types of dogs. My slide is not room for them all. But all of them came from one ancestral source, perhaps hundreds, perhaps thousands of years ago. And from that one ancestral source, by selective breeding nowadays, 
on my natural selection previous land, different types of dogs have come to be the little dog. This is an example of adaptation. This is an example of deliberately selecting figures in these figures that we want to benefit from and we want to highlight. And that's an example of adaptation. Changes in the living things can be produced by selective breeding. Those who breed race horses do it for a specific reason. Those who breed Shetland ponies do it for a different reason. But they all belong to the horse family. And those who want a particular kind of dogs do it because they want a particular kind of dogs and they select the parents. They actually select the breeding. That's something that mankind has taken control of, and it has been used, well, sometimes for the better, other times for the worse. In nature, though, the same thing happens by what we call survival of the fittest, which is, given that many creatures live in a hostile environment, with predators on their track, and with environmental and weather conditions that can be extremely damaging, it makes sense that those creatures which are least able to adapt to the change will not live on beyond a generation or two. This is natural selection, selection occurring in nature. And it does happen, it happens within species. But it's always within species. It is never from one species to another. A favourite example that everybody can relate to is, you know that rabbits have got natural enemies, or foxes. So the faster rabbits will escape from the foxes longest, and the slower rabbits will be caught and eaten. So the faster rabbits will breed and go on to the next generation. But no matter how often that happens, and it does happen quite often, no matter how often that happens, Rabbits never become hares, or greyhounds, or any such which. Rabbits remain rabbits, horses remain horses, dogs remain dogs, although there is micro-evolution within these species. I'm emphasizing that point because so often people are confused between what you know has to be true because you can see it, and what the big evolution theory proposes is true because it suits the theory. These changes do not, cannot cross the boundary of the species for a reason that we'll come to. Natural selection cannot cause a new species to arise from an old one. And as I said, the word species, I've used the word kind, a kind of animal, a kind of creature. And I'm using that word deliberately for the reason that we come apparent. Natural selection then cannot change one kind, one species into another for the following reason. Natural selection can only select from information that is already there in the species. And the information is coded in the genetic material that is in those cells of every species. Within those cells are a huge amount of information. And natural selection can select some of it and leave the other bit out if it's suitable, if it's helpful. Natural selection cannot start off evolution because there's nothing for it to work on, nothing for it to select from. And natural selection can only cause a loss of information in the genetic code. And natural selection cannot plan ahead it's not like, I think I used the example on Monday, of planning ahead to make better phones, or better computers, or better motor cars. You can plan ahead because you, as an intelligent person, know what you want to see. But in nature, it, there's no foresight. It's simply what happens, happens. And natural selection cannot plan ahead to make new species. It can only select from the existing information in the genes of the cell. Mr. Darwin of 
בעצם לא נזוק, אם כבר בשקר מדייקי אינטרס עיניים. On the origin of species by natural selection. The origin of species by natural selection. With respect, Mr. Darwin, your word is wrong. What nature teaches is not the change of the origin of species, it is the fixity of species. Once species are there, you cannot change one into another. The boundary between them cannot be crossed. Breeding, fertile breeding, is always within species. All these different dogs, I showed you, they can breed with each other. But a dog can't breed with a wolf. The DNA coded information within the cells of each species is unique to that species. We will look in a moment as to how it can be changed, but it cannot be improved. So the big lesson from nature is the fixity of species. I'm often interested in this because I've enjoyed observing nature from since I was a teenager, I guess. And it's interesting just to think that if you see two blackbirds, they will mate with each other naturally without any problem. But you will never see a blackbird try to mate with a thrush. You folk live in Aberdeen where the seagulls are so numerous, and there's about five or six subspecies of seagulls, and you will never see a herring gull mating with a black bat dog. The species are fixed, and somehow or other nature has made that happen. You say, how does a blackbird know another blackbird to mate with it and distinguish it from a thrush? Nature's not that then. Nature is full of the fixity of species. The origin of species did not come about by natural selection. Evolution's history of life is this. Over billions of years, all species evolved upward, they say, from a common ancestor, an ancestor whose genetic material was simpler than the one that's now here. And that means that more new information is needed in the genetic code to make more complex creatures. That makes sense, doesn't it? The more complex a system is, the more information we need to put in to make it work. Whereas if it's simpler, it doesn't need so much information. And evolution says, we are all back upwards from an ancestor that everything had to branch out, as we saw in Darwin's tree of life last evening, to branch out into different species, and each of these different species needs new information to be provided. And in the standard biology textbooks <coughs> that are filling the libraries and filling the school shelves, this is the story that you will find. And this is another look at the geological column, complete with coloured pictures of how the tiny things at the bottom in the Cambrian layer, where the fossils are hardly found at all, they're just a few spores, just a few uh, small cells, gradually got more complicated, and gradually got more complicated still, and more complicated still, and more complicated still, until we got back around over the mammoths, and the four-footed creatures that run about, and the two-footed creatures as well. And all of these, the higher up you go, must have more information in their genes than the ones way down there, some of which can hardly move, some of which are very limited in their attainments. The higher up you go, the more information you need to supply into the genes. And that isn't really playing the game, because you can't get new information for nothing. It needs to be put there. So that's evolution's picture of life. Let's look at what the Bible says about the history of life. And very simply, you could find this on the first page of the Bible. It says that God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps upon the earth after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And it adds, male and female created he them. In that sentence, notice the repetition of the words, after his kind. That's the reason why a few minutes ago I said I'm going to use the word species and change it into the word kind. 
because had the book of Genesis chapter 1 been translated a bit later than it was for it to get the authorised version, it's very probable the word species would be there. Because that's what the word kind means. It is a significant species of creature. So the Bible says that it wasn't just one ancestor. There was a whole series of ancestors, each created as a whole, in the animal kingdom and the vegetable kingdom. If you've read Genesis chapter 1 recently, and if you haven't, I recommend you do tonight when we think about this. Throughout the creation record, we read that God made specific things, and he made them complete, and he made them separate. And we're dealing with the animal kingdom. And in the animal kingdom, God made so many of them after their time. Significantly, too, it says, in this context, he made them male and female. My know it used to be not the done thing to talk about sex in a public meeting. But let me talk about it in a very sensible way. You know as well as I do that for sexual reproduction to work, it needs a male and a female. Not only went externally, but internally. And if you try to work this out in evolutionary terms, you really are stuck. Because how does a non-sexual reproduction, which must have occurred at some point way back there, how can that change into a sexual reproduction? Given that the very success of that generation depends on a completely sexual depends on a complete sexual interaction. Otherwise, there are no babies. But the Bible says God did it this way. He created them male and female. The obvious way in which to get the next generation is to have a fully functioning male and a fully functioning female, whether it be a rabbit or a dog or any other such thing. You would only get success in breeding to the next generation by already complete functioning males and females. And the Bible says, God did it that way because that's the obvious way to try. That's the way we can recognize. But in evolution theory, you will search in vain. I've tried it, and we have no real explanation to give how sexual reproduction came to be from all these faceless, shapeless, imaginary creatures away back somewhere millions of years ago. So, let's look at the evolutionary picture and the creation picture of explaining changes in living creatures. The evolution picture is what I would call bottom up. It starts off with very simple things, which over several million years become less simple. They manage to grow, you might say legs and feet or something. They got less simple anyway. And then as time went on, they got more complex. As well as legs and feet, they got arms and wings or something. And then they got more complex still, say the evolution theory, until, well, maybe the like of us who sit here having our eyes on planet Earth some long time ago. That is the evolution story, bottom up. And the point to note is that at each stage, at each generation that changes, <coughs> new and very complex genetic information has to be added. The change, for example, as they tell us from, let me think, from a fish to a reptile needs something new added. Reptiles have other features that fish won't have, and these other features won't come to pass unless there is in the cell of that creature the DNA information to enable it to have the arms and legs that fish don't have. Do you know what I mean? So each stage requires the addition of new and complex genetic information. On the other hand, let's look at the creation model, which is a top-down model. It looks like this. I have a room on my slides for as many as I'd like, but let's just say here are four of many different kinds that God did at the beginning. It could be cattle, it could be fishes, I'll leave you to the other two. Any different species you want to think about, God made its four mother there at the beginning. And these original kinds, over periods of time, not nearly as long as the evolutionary ones, but over reasonable periods of time, 
the successive generations of these kinds changed. How did they change? Well, the kinds became what the biologists call genera. They then became species, then became subspecies, such as we can see around today. But for that to happen, it's <coughs> the opposite of the one on the left. In the original kinds, God had put this huge store of genetic information. And from that huge store, the information was selected or resorted so that within a species, within a kind, particular features could be demonstrated and shown and emphasized. Some people have faced this, and um, what they call neo-Darwinism looks at changes in cells and tries to get away around it. And says, yes, that's right, we do recognize that the DNA has to change, the information that has to change, but there are ways of doing that. So they conduct many experiments in the cell and the field of genetics to look at changes that occur in the DNA of cells. What do they do? Well, in the lab, we have <laughs> organisms that reproduce very quickly. Microbes, small insects, fruit flies is a favourite one. And experiments on these, having been down there over the best part of nearly 100 years, show that virtually all induced changes, which they call mutations, are harmful. They don't lead to better fruit flies. They lead to fruit flies of only one wing, or have lost a leg, or have lost feathers. The, the information in the DNA is degraded, it's lost. The changes are not beneficial, you don't get bigger and better, you get less successful ones. And these changes are not the result of adding new information in the DNA, which is what evolution requires. They are the consequence of deleting or losing or changing the existing uh, information already in the DNA. The DNA of each species is different. And it gives the different features, characteristics that each creature has. But you cannot change the DNA of one kind, one species, into the DNA of another kind by mutation. Any changes that do occur are extremely limited. They are usually harmful. DNA is such a marvelous bit of engineering, chemically speaking, that the DNA can repair itself if there's a fault in it. And if anything does get through to the next generation, it is frequently bred out. In other words, survival of the fittest ensures that the damaged DNA species does not survive. Before I go further, let me give you an analogy. When I was a lot younger, the ambition of youngsters was to own a car. And usually you could start off with an old buyer. I suppose life hasn't changed all that much for young folk, has it? Anyway, the big question was often asked, well, if I get an old banged out Beetle, you know what's going on, Beetle? They're still around, aren't they? They're very much changed from the one behind you. If you got one of these, how would you change it into a Rolls Royce? What would you do to change a Volkswagen Beetle into a Rolls Royce? According to evolution theory, what you would do would be to hit it with a hammer, to bombard it with x-rays, to try heating and cooling it. And if you did that, you know, you would never change your old banger into a Rolls Royce. In fact, the only way you could do it would be to take all the metallic components and all the rubber components and all the other components that make up the Volkswagen Beetle melt them down and then start again and recycle them to make the new one. And that is similar to what evolution is asking us to believe about how one species can become another one. The DNA information, which I will talk about more on a subsequent evening, maybe next week, it is so specialized 
it is so cleverly designed that you cannot in any way improve a species by just bagging away at its DNA by any means whatsoever. Let's do a checklist. Adaptation, yes, you see that in nature. Evolution, no you don't. Here's the things that happen. In adaptation, you rearrange, you change or you remove the information already there. From the existing huge store that was there in the beginning, that you dried out your drawer from there in the different kinds at the beginning, you can select, see, you can select some of the information and allow it to produce a new subspecies. For example, there is a species called bear, <coughs> and you get polar bears, and you get brown bears. But you can imagine a time, can you not, when there were just bears. But when the environment changed, when things began to get awkward for some of the bears, those that were brown would survive longest in the forest region. There is those that were white would survive longest in the Arctic region. So both polar bears and brown bears had the same ancestor. But at some point where things were becoming difficult for them, they would survive where their colours blended in with the environment. But the main bears, they didn't change into foxes. Mr. Darwin went to the Galapagos Islands and he discovered some finches there, well birds called finches, that he'd never seen in England. They had some different features. And on these isolated islands away on the west of the west coast of South America, these finches had survived with quite different features from the English finches that had found the countryside. And they say, oh, here's evolution at work. No, it's not. It's adaptation at work. They were still finches. They hadn't changed into blackbirds even. So within any given species, within any different, different, given kind, subspecies arise. So that within the realm of ornithology, there are different genera, as they call them. For example, there's the crow genera, which contains ravens, carrion crows, hoody crows, jackdaws, and rooks, all of which can trace ancestry back to a common point. But the interesting thing is now, these subspecies I've mentioned are now so isolated from their cousins, dare I call them, that you will not get a rook breeding with a jackdaw. They've now got their own genetic, genetic material which has become fixed in the species, so that the individual subspecies have now got a close relationship with each other, which they do not have with even those that are quite near to them. But that is not the creation of a new species. So yes, adaptation works. Evolution doesn't work because evolution requires that more information be added. New information to get something new that will be a new species. It has to supplement what is there already. And it doesn't happen with no outside input. If you want it to happen, you need to put it there. But even if you did put it there, it wouldn't match what was there already. So do distinguish, please, between adaptation, which is an observable scientific fact, and evolution, which is a proposed theory, against which the laws of science really work hard. Evolution is not supported by the laws of science. My lecture number one. Evolution is not shown in the fossil record anywhere. My, le my lecture number two. Evolution is not demonstrated by experiments on living things, as I said just a few minutes ago in this present lecture. Evolution is not able to begin in life. Evolution is not a fact. Although it's sold as a fact, it's said to be a fact, it's said to be an indisputable fact by many in high places, so that if you don't believe it to be a fact, you're classed as something that none at all.
or some kind of backward looking being, evolution is not a fact. But take courage, evolution isn't believed by everybody. The popular thing is that oh, all the scientists believe in evolution. No, no, they don't. There's an interesting book being written not long ago which lists, for the sake of listing things, several thousand scientists in many countries of the world who have signed up to say that they believe evolution theory is wrong. I happen to believe that as well, although my name is not in the book, that's no big deal. But it is a fact that not all scientists whether they are religious believers or not, from the science point of view, many scientists say no, evolution is impossible. On the other hand, creation is not contradicted by science. Creation is not incompatible from experience. By that I mean, anticipating something that will happen soon, This tray of foam bakes was created by somebody. We are going to get the benefit of it in just a few minutes. Creation is the kind of thing we're accustomed to facing up to. And creation is not difficult to understand. Evolution is difficult to understand. Creation is not difficult to understand. It makes sense. And creation Actually, although it's sensible, although it's just the kind of thing you expect, not contradict by, although it is, it's not really wanted by too many people. Not wanted by too many people. There must be a reason for that. And the reason basically is that people do not want to accept the fact that there is a creator. A creator who by definition must be greater than the creation. A creator whose wisdom and skill and the vastness of his power must be greater than what the creation itself contains. I like the phrase Almighty God because he is Almighty. But many people do not want God and there must be a reason for that. Well, I guess most of you here know the reason. So let me run over it quickly. And summarise before we get there, just this little life. How did life begin? Number one, it needed a proper start. Number two, life can only come from previous life. And number three, life had to be created by a life giver. And that life giver is God. Yes. That life giver is God. There is no other alternative. We've been thinking tonight about life in general, life in living things, and grass and trees and land in the field and dogs at your knee. But what about your life? Because of all the creatures on earth, even evolution says mankind is at the top. Now, Christians believe that mankind is at the top for, but for a different reason. Christians believe that mankind is at the top of the creation and on earth because God put man there for a reason that I'm sure you know. So, what about your life? What about my life? It's important, is it not? It's significant. It's precious. It's also transient. Interrupt. All of us here tonight are getting older by the second. All of us are moving inevitably towards life's end, however that may come. It's a fact about life. Not only is your life important, significant, precious, but we know it's passing. Why is it transient interrupt? Why does death have to come? and overtake us all, and overtake every other living thing. What's the reason for that? Well, if you believe the Bible, and if you read the Bible, you get the reason. The reason says that death has passed upon all, upon all people, because everyone has sinned. If there was no sin in the world, there would be no death. 
the rural local industrial experience, as well as from South Korea and the way one of the people that sin is around us in the human race everywhere. And the Bible says, because everyone that sins, everyone will die. <coughs> The good news of the Christian gospel is that you can get eternal life. You can get a different kind of life. And actually, you can get it now. Don't wait until this life is over to see whether or not you're going to get it. The Bible says it's available here and now. But how? How do you get eternal life now? The Bible says, as in Adam, all die. In other words, we face our ancestors inevitably back to this first man that God created, Adam. He's one of the special kind that God created. A bit different from the other, all the other kinds, but nevertheless, sharing a large number of common features with other kinds. God made Adam special. In Adam's genetic code, uh, which there uh, was the genetic code, that is inside your cells and mine, passed on down countless generations. But the Bible says, Adam unfortunately disobeyed God. He wouldn't trust God. God said, That's sin. And because of Adam's sin, our big ancestor, we all must die. But the good news of the gospel is that there's another man who comes up to the scene, and his name is Jesus Christ. And unlike Adam and every person who belongs to Adam's race, Jesus Christ had no sin at all of his own. So the wonderful message of the gospel is that the sinless person of Jesus Christ was nailed to a cross to pay the price for your sins and mine. He died, he took that penalty for us. And so in Christ, Everyone who is willing to remain alive, and in fact, God is willing and able and wanting to give to everyone who is willing to receive it eternal life. And it will only be through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, I asked tonight, what is your life? I asked tonight, where did life come from? Let me finish with this one. That in the old world, one day long ago, God sent his only son. And he sent his son into the world so that we might live through him. Not die because we were related to Adam, but live through faith in Christ. And when Jesus was here, he said, he must be born again. Because really, if you think about it, that's the only way you can get new life. We all got life from our parents the moment we were born. We were born into a natural family and received the life that we now enjoy and that we used to interact with others because of. Even so, the Lord Jesus Christ said, if you want to see eternal life, if you want to be part of the family of God, you need another birth, you need a different kind of birth. John chapter 3 verse 7 calls it the new birth, you must be born again. And for everyone who is born again, they're part of the family of God. They find that other Christians are their brothers and sisters. They find that God is their Father. And they find that heaven will be the eventual home. Sin has ruined this earth in more ways than one. But eternal life begins on earth for those who trust Christ and goes on into heaven forever for everyone who is truly born again. I hope you've had that experience. If not, can I invite you here to think about it? Because even that is more important than coming to lectures like this and learning about creation and evolution. Interesting though it is, don't miss the point of what God wants for you, both for now and forever. Thanks again for listening. One more lecture this week, and then we'll have a weekend off and start again next Monday, God willing. But once again, before we have a tea, let's give God thanks for it and ask his blessing. Father, we do give thanks for what we've been able to listen to and look at tonight. We pray the point of these lessons may not be lost upon any one of us. But while we are interested in life and its origin, we also 
concerned about our life and our destiny. And we say, every one of us may know where we're going. We give thanks then for all our goodness to us today in so many ways, and we give thanks for this refreshment that we share. We give our thanks in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. One final thing to say, there is now an adequate supply of these books at the back of the hall. Please take one if you've not already got one. I do recommend it, especially to younger people, not because I have any the offer of it, but many people have been helped by it, and you will find in it a large number of the things I've tried to say in these lectures, and these books are available at the back for free, if you promise to read them. Don't take them and stick them on a shelf, that won't do you any good, but take them and dip into them. And like I've been, be amazed at the wonder of God's creation. Thank you.